All right. So we're going to talk about respiration today. We've already talked a bit about um, circulation, and we'll finish up circulation probably on the next lecture. But this one is going to be dealing with respiration. And so um, we're going to talk about gas exchange in animals. So respiration gases, so respiratory gases are oxygen and carbon dioxide, as you already would know. Um, <clears throat> the reason why you need to breathe oxygen is for um, to produce ATP from the breakdown of carbohydrates and other nutrients. Um, in, car in the mitochondria, um, oxygen is needed and it comes in and it breaks a sugar. As you know, sugar will be made up of lots of different carbon atoms. The oxygen will come in and then help cleave off these carbon atoms, making carbon dioxide, which is the waste product of cellular respiration. So again, this is the reason why you need to have a respiratory system. Now, again, a system is a little different. So a lot of all animals that I'm aware of have some type of respiration, but to have a respiratory system doesn't necessarily exist in all animals. For instance, a sponge, the simplest animal, have cells that would just interact directly with the environment. So they don't have lungs or anything like that. They would have cellular respiration with the mitochondria though. And again, the interesting thing about this is a phenomenon that people don't realize is when you're trying to lose weight. I ask, you might ask a lay person, how do you lose weight? Where does the weight go? Is it through, you know, and you always hear kind of answers like you sweat it out, or that you, um, you know, you lose it through urination and all that other kind of stuff. And of course, you can lose water weight those ways and through heat. But the real way that you lose body weight and fat is ultimately you breathe it out. You're breathing out CO2. So when you lose five pounds of fat, most of it is due to cellular respiration. And of course, this is based on calories in and calories out. But again, you're breathing off that weight. Now, granted, you'll lose water weight and other things like that. But when you're talking about the real weight loss that is long term, then it's through these other means. <clears throat> so, um, diffusion. Um, is the way that gas exchange takes place. Now remember, diffusion is going from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. So the atmosphere has more oxygen than your lungs would have, for instance. And so oxygen would, um, as it comes into your lungs, will diffuse from the alveoli, which is, you'll see in a little bit, is air sacs at the end of your respiratory system and will provide um, a gas exchange with that in the capillaries where the oxygen will move into the hemoglobin that is present in the red blood cells. Remember, red blood cells are called erythrocytes, or at least we'll get into that a little bit more at the next lecture. While carbon dioxide will diffuse from the blood. Again, the carbon dioxide is that buildup after cellular respiration. Now, it's much easier to get oxygen from the air than from water. So a lot of aquatic animals have a harder time getting oxygen until they, except that they've evolved for it, of course, where they have um, gills with huge surface areas. Oxygen and obtaining oxygen from the environment is all about surface area. In fact, your lungs, if you were just to lay it out on to the ground from your chest cavity, is thin and has a huge surface area that it would actually um, cover, the surface area would actually cover a tennis court. So we're talking huge amount of surface area inside your chest cavity. Now fish gills and all those kind of stuff have huge surface area as well, or they also deal with it by being cold blooded or what they call ectothermic, or the proper way to call it is ectothermic, which we lay people would call it cold blooded. And so you don't have a high metabolism, you can kind of get away with um, less sophisticated respiratory systems. If you have high oxygen needs, you need um, obviously to have higher metabolism. 
oxygen again diffuses much more rapidly in air, in fact, about 8,000 times more rapidly. But again, if you're dealing with water, it's a lot more viscous and so forth. So you have to have other modifications like gills. Um, carbon dioxide diffuses out of the body at about the same rate as oxygen diffuses in. But again, the oxygen will ultimately attach to hemoglobin. These are um, iron containing proteins that we'll talk about in the next lecture or more, or maybe a little bit later in this lecture, but mostly in the next lecture. Um, carbon dioxide is actually running around in your blood as a biocarbonate. So it's actually diffused in your blood. And then we'll see a little bit later is an enzyme that helps to actually convert that biocarbonate into carbon dioxide once it reaches your lungs. Um, the partial pressures, so again, that allows it to move in the, into the blood. The partial pressures of gas are not the same because of the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is low. So in fact, um, the carbon dioxide is higher in your blood um, than it is, and then in your lungs when it's re um, released from the blood than it is in the atmosphere. So this allows for diffusion from your lungs into the atmosphere. So again, oxygen can move into your <clears throat> lungs because there's a higher partial pressure than um, it can leave. So for water breathing animals, it's a, uh, a surrounding environment is high in decaying organic materials. That's a problem because it generates high levels of CO2 and may not be able to support life. So that would affect their diffusion rate. So if you have a situation where you have lots of decaying organic materials in a pond of some sort and you end up, and it's a double whammy if you end up with a lot of algae there, the oxygen levels can be really low and the CO2 levels can be really high, making it for very difficult for um, air breathing animals to live. Now, again, not all animals are gonna have lungs and things like that. As I mentioned before, you're not gonna even see a respiratory system in something like a sponge. And this is also true for things like this flatworm or the, the animal is so thin and the surface area is so high that oxygen and CO2 are diffused directly through the membranes. Um, we have here a salamander that has gills. The gills allow for this huge surface area. So in a sense, you can almost think about all that surface area those gills make on that salamander to try to equate to somewhat to the surface area of this flatworm. So again, that's what maximizes pulling oxygen out of the water. That combined with the fact that they might get a little bit through their skin in some cases maybe, but more importantly, they're also cold blooded. So they're not really running around having a high metabolism. So you don't necessarily need as much oxygen. Diffusion of oxygen in water is slow though. And, um, so even cells with low um, metabolism um, still need oxygen, of course. Slow molecular diffusion of oxygen is a problem because oxygen must diffuse through the aqueous cytoplasm of the cell to reach the mitochondria. So again, um, now there are fish with high metabolisms, comparatively speaking, but it is a challenge to get this oxygen moving because remember, the it's a viscous layer of the water so it's going to um, have some challenges for aquatic animals animals that have no internal transport of oxygen are either severely limited in body size or have all bodies that are flattened or built around a central cavity so again this flatworm is so flat that it helps for oxygen to reach um, from the outside through their cytoplasm to their mitochondria where you can have cellular respiration. So that's how this animal's modified itself. Or again, they're gonna have um, limited size. You're not gonna see salamanders that are 20 feet long, for instance. Um, but again, there are fish that have evolved to live in oceans and stuff that are super huge like great white sharks. Now here's our salamander, you can see that they have external gills, so they're not really protected and they're free in the environment to absorb water. 
Um, they're again, they're thin membranes um, and they're relatively large in consideration of their body. While animals like this crayfish here have internal gills and the shell provides protection from, for the gills um, so they don't get damaged. Then you have lungs, which are internal cavities for gas exchange with air breathers. Lungs are highly divided to provide greater surface area and elastic to prevent inflammation, or not inflammation, inflation and deflation. Again, the surface area of lungs can be up to about the size of a tennis court. <clears throat> Insects don't have lungs, but they actually have a gas exchange system that involves trachea and spiracles. So they actually have holes along the side of their body and they have these tracheal tubes that are branched thinner and thinner to the point where they call them tracheoles that actually provide the gas exchange directly with the tissue. So they're not using hemoglobin or anything like that. Um, but the actual air tube will um, be right next to the tissues that need them. Again, this is probably a system that's gonna limit the size of the animal greatly, particularly in our current atmosphere. More prehistoric atmospheres, you could have um, dragonflies about the size of a bird. But now with our current atmosphere, um, that's not quite possible. Again, they don't breathe through their mouth. So these only animals that breathe through their mouth are animals with these internal lungs, for instance. So here is the um, body of a insect. Over on the left side on the bottom, you see a caterpillar. And then you can see the holes are spiracles. So that's where the air would come from the outside. Those spiracles can open and close and actually block the air hole. So if they dropped into like a, a pond accidentally, the spiracles will close and they'll kind of flap around hoping to reach a twig or the ground or something like that. Otherwise they're wide open. And again, they'll lead to these clear tubules on the, in the picture C, figure C. And you'll see this is the trachea and you'll see that there's tracheal rings that help hold and provide rigidity to the trachea. And then these holes keep breaking down into smaller, small tubes and, um, like the ones you see on, in that picture where they get really small. Those will be known as tracheoles. And again, they'll provide gas exchange directly with the tissues, whether it be oxygen going to the tissues or carbon dioxide leaving the tissues. There's a lot of air sacs that can be found in some insects and their bodies can move around in such a way that's kind of like a, an accordion, you know, when accordions you play it and you bring it in and out, they can kind of move their bodies in such a way that it helps to draw some air through their spiracles into these air sacs. Insects can do some pretty cool things. This is a water beetle and aquatic beetle of some sort that can actually form, it wouldn't be hairs, but it looks like little hairs on their cuticle of their outer shell to form this air sac that kind of functions like scuba equipment. So this is a way for this beetle to go underwater, do its thing, grab some food, whatever and it will carry its own air around in a little air sac. And again, that they're, they're fine like structures like hairs, they're not hairs because they're not mammals, but they're hair-like cuticles that allow for this bubble to form around them. And then they can continue breathing um, through this air. So they're like a scuba diver. So they invented scuba before we did. Now here's how fish breathe. Again, it is through um, gills, but their gills work in an interesting way called a countercurrent exchange. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But here's a fish. And again, this varies a lot from different species of fish, but typically they might be able to pump water across their gills. Um, they often will have little hard structures called gill arches that are bony that help protect their gills. And then right behind it will be the gills themselves. And then blood flows through them. And again, this is going to be um, very um, loaded with capillaries to absorb as much oxygen out of the water as possible. They also have opercular flaps that help protect the soft gills underneath. 
And again, they can also, in some cases, pump the water themselves. In other cases, like sharks, they require more swimming around to keep the water or, or have some type of flow so the water continues, passes over the gills. <clears throat> each gill has hundreds of subunits called gill filaments, and each filament is covered with lamella like for gas exchange that's on the surface. And if you remember Napoleon Dynamite, one of his quotes was, I caught you a delicious bass. But obviously this might be dating me in this, in this lecture a little bit since Napoleon Dynamite hasn't been out for a long time. But anyway, this is looking at the um, lamella, which is, um, has capillaries in it and they're going in the, and the blood is going in the opposite direction that the water's going in. So the water's going in through their mouth and across their gills and out their opercula. Well, the, the um, blood inside the gills and, and through the lamella is going in the opposite direction. And what, does, what that does is cause a countercurrent to form, meaning that the blood is going in one direction, the fresh oxygenated water is going in the opposite. So we call that a countercurrent. <clears throat> and so again, this maximizes the ability to pull out as much oxygen out of the water as possible. Um, some fish, as I mentioned before, have a two pump mechanism, which can allow their mouths to open and pump the water across the gills. But other fish, such as sharks and tunas, must um, have their mouths open to ventilate their gills constantly. Now, here is two models. The top one is called the, counter, the concurrent flow, and the bottom one is called the countercurrent flow. Realize that the bottom one, the countercurrent flow, is the way that fish do it. And this is a way to show you how the countercurrent flow is very good at maximizing pulling oxygen out of the water. The concurrent would be what would happen um, hypothetically if the blood drew went in the same direction as um, the gills. So again, if you go back to the previous picture, you can see that the gill the gills and the lamella, the water is going in the opposite direction of the water flow. So that's the way it happens and that's counter current. But again, this graph here shows you that the counter current maximizes pulling oxygen out of the water. And so if you look at the bottom one, you'll see that the blood has 100% oxygen and the water has 100% oxygen at the very end of it. Um, right where the oxygen water is coming right into the into the gill lamella, and so as it goes through, <clears throat> the water always has a little bit more um, concentration of oxygen than the gills, and so we always got this ratio of a little bit more in the water than in the gills. So you got eighty percent, seventy five percent, seventy five percent in the water oxygen-wise, 70% in the blood, and so forth, until you get down to the end, where you have 25% oxygen in the water and 20% in the blood. So what that does is, again, allows for a concentration gradient to be present and move oxygen from the water to the blood. But if you go to the concurrent, it goes in the same direction, and eventually what happens is that the amount of oxygen in the water equals the amount of oxygen in the blood. So you have um, equal saturation. And so you don't have any more oxygen coming in the blood. That's a bad thing. So that's why concurrent does not work for fish. And fish have thus evolved this countercurrent mechanism or method. Now, again, remember fish are ectothermic, they're cold blooded. And so their metabolism is linked to their temperature of their body or temperature of the water. And so if the water gets warmer, their metabolism increases. The problem with that though, as their metabolism increases, their oxygen needs also increase. But the problem is warm water um, doesn't hold oxygen as well as cold water. So um, they lose out because their metabolism increases and yet the ability to breathe um, 
there's less oxygen in the water, so it becomes a double whammy. Now, this again will be highly variable based on the fish species. A good example of this would be trout. Trout do great in cold water. They can pull the oxygen out they need. But if you put them into warm water, they don't get the oxygen they need and they will die. But other fish have evolved to dealing with that lower amount of oxygen. Maybe they have more modified gills or something of that nature. I'm not really sure. But the point is that is in part related to it. And so here you can see a picture and you can see the metabolism of the fish activity increases with water temperature. The fish activities are the blue arrows going up. Um, so a resting fish's metabolism and active fish metabolism is what they're showing here. But in either case, their oxygen consumption increases dramatically when the water temperature increases. Look at how 40 is to my, is dramatically higher than at 10 degrees. But the problem again is if you look at the red, the oxygen content of the water dramatically decreases. <clears throat> now birds have high metabolism, so they need modified lungs and to, to maximize the amount of oxygen pulled uh, out of the environment. So here's their trachea. The trachea um, leads to lungs and then they lead to these air sacs. And these air sacs are connected to the lungs, but are not involved in gas exchange. So what this happens is they, the air sacs get to fill up with air and then pass over to the lungs in such a way to really maximize the absorption of oxygen out of the environment. In birds, the bronchia are divided into parabronchia that run parallel to one another, branching from the parabronchia are air capillaries where the actual gas exchange takes place. So let's look at a model, but here you can see the air sacs. And so it's going, air is going to go out to these air sacs back here and then to the lungs. So here's the peribronchius and the air. And you can see this, it goes through. The air will lead to the capillaries again. Birds have a high metabolism. Flying takes a lot of energy, so they need to maximize the amount of oxygen they pull out of the environment. So they can maximize more oxygen out of the air than we can as mammals. So here's the parabronchius associated with the capillaries. Now here's how the model of how the, bear, the, uh, the air sacs work. We have posterior air sacs, so inhalation takes place during the trachea that leads all the way back to the posterior air sacs. Then the air goes through the parabronchias, as you saw in the previous picture here, and then leads right next to the capillaries to the anterior air sac. And then from the anterior air sac, it will be exhaled. This allows for maximizing pulling out as much air out of, or oxygen out of the air as possible, unlike what we were seeing with the, um, you know, the birds or with the mammals, which you'll see in a moment. For the mammals, it's a little different. Here is a spirometer and you can see, now again, there are excellent mammals that are very good at pulling out oxygen and we have important, and we do have a big need for oxygen too as mammals. Um, but here's basically the breathing of a human. And we're using a spirometer to measure how much air is happening at any given time going in and out. And so in mammals, ventilation is called tidal. Air flows in and out at about the same, through the same route, unlike the birds, as you saw, where a bunch of the posterior air sacs and through the, the lungs and then out the anterior air sacs. At rest, the amount of air exchange is the tidal volume. So while you're sitting here watching this video, you'd be looking at your tidal volume, which would just be a little bit of inhalation, a little bit of exhalation. And you'd always have this, a little bit of air in your lungs. You weren't maximizing the amount of inhalation or pushing out as much air as possible. But in the case of mammals, as long as you're alive anyway, your lungs always have a little bit of air. And your last breath, um, when they call it the death rattle, and you have a little bit of spit on, that's usually a little bit of that air in your lungs collapsing. 
The additional volume of air taken in by inhaling deeply is called the inspiratory reserve volume. So if you're to breathe in as much as you can, that'd be your inspiratory reserve value. Now, if you breathe out as much as you possibly can, that would be your expiratory reserve volume. But again, there would still be a little bit of air in your lungs, so your lungs don't completely collapse. But combining this would be called your vital capacity. And then of course you have, so that would be the what you use would be your vital capacity. And then of course your total lung capacity would also include the air that you could not exhale, but is still present in your lungs. So that would include the residual volume. In tidal breathing, the incoming air mixes with the stale air remaining in your lungs, which um, makes a partial, as severely limits the, the gradient of oxygen. The volume of stale air is the sum of the residual and the expiratory reserve volume. Tidal breathing also reduces gas exchange efficiency by not permitting countercurrent gas exchange between the air and the blood. So again, we're not as efficient as birds and, or fish in some regards. To offset the inefficiency of tidal breathing, mammalian lungs have enormous surface area. So this is the way we try to deal with that problem. Because again, with the stale air in our lungs, we have some carbon dioxide and stuff like that. And, and our, we're not pulling out all the oxygen that we possibly can out of our lungs. So we have some inefficiency. But our lung surface area is enormous. And that's how we make up for that inefficiency. And so again, as I mentioned, the lung capacity, or when you lay it out, the lungs have a surface area that would be equivalent to a basketball court or a tennis court. I think more like a tennis court, but either way, you got the gist. Here's what the lungs look like in humans. And we have actually multiple air sacs. There's like, I need to double check that, but like, I believe two on one side and three on the other. And what happens is if one of your lobes is damaged and not working, you still have other lobes that keep you breathing. These are very delicate, lungs are very delicate. And obviously one of the reasons why it's important to have rib cages to help protect your lungs. This over on the right side is a wax figure showing you all the alveoli and, and things like that as it breaks down into smaller and smaller uh, tubes. So it starts off as um, trachea that break off into bronchia and then those tubes break off into bronchioles that ultimately lead to alveoli where the actual um, gas exchange takes place. So that's where it terminates at. Your diaphragm below is actually like a stretched muscle that, open, that makes your chest cavity change its size to inflate your lungs. There's no muscles on your lungs to help push your lungs out or in to help inhale. It's actually the diaphragm increasing your chest cavity size. And then you also have some extra muscles that help lift your rib cage. That's what changes your air pressure inside your lungs that allows for air to either come in or out. So when your lungs, when your, when your rib cage is close and you're breathing out, the air pressure actually is greater inside your lungs than the atmosphere, allowing for air to leave. While if you inhale, you're pulling your diaphragm down, you're increasing your chest cavity and that causes the lungs to inflate. Um, there's also mucuses and surfactants that are found along your the outside of your lungs and inside your lungs to help keep everything nice and lubricated. Um, this helps prevent your lungs from sticking to your rib cage, for instance. And it also functions as a mucus escalator to help remove um, the debris that might be found in your lungs, the yucky stuff or, or smog and things like that. So the mucus escalator is essential for helping to remove um, products out of your body. There's little cilia that help the beat constantly to move this mucus up and of course you hack it out and spit it out. Unfortunately, some people with cystic fibrosis have a chloride channel, and I'll mention this maybe more in another class, that prevents their mucus from being watery. So the mucus gets too thick and that ends up causing bacteria to grow in it 
and cause all sorts of infections or blockage and the mucus gets too thick, it's not watered down enough. And that's one of the problems with cystic fibrosis. Um, it's related to a chloride channel that allows for water to enter and get into the mucus. Again, preemie babies can also run into respiratory stress when they don't have that mucus and the surfactants that would coat the outside of the lungs, causing the lungs to not move properly with the surface tension and causes it to stick and stuff like that. The alveoli are at the end. These are air sacs. Um, they look like grapes at the end of the air sac. So this is where gas exchange takes place. So when you actually breathe in, the alveoli will inflate and um, then um, the air will leave, the oxygen will leave and go into your blood and attach to hemoglobin that's found on the red blood cells. While the carbon dioxide that's floating around in your blood is bicarbonate, will get converted into carbon dioxide gas, which will then go into the alveoli, and then you can breathe that out. This is just to show you how thin it is. So you can see it's thin enough that it's basically the red blood cells are having, and capillaries are having to line up. And then the alveoli are literally thin, flat cells that the gas exchange can take place at. Here's a picture on the right, again, using wax to kind of coat the lungs. That's what you saw here too. This is basically a wax that they put through the lungs to show all the tubules and stuff like that. And then here is the alveoli. And then this is another picture on the right showing you how the um, alveoli is thinner than the actual capillaries. And again, the oxygen will be picked up in the hemoglobin. It has about 60 times the capacity of blood plasma itself to transport oxygen. So that's why it's so critical for us to have hemoglobin in our blood to transport the oxygen. Now remember, as I mentioned before, what causes air to enter into your lungs is the diaphragm. The diaphragm changes your chest cavity size. And by doing so, when the chest cavity enlarges, the lungs will have less air pressure than the outside and will inflate, as you can see that on picture on the left picture. On the right picture, when the, um, the diaphragm uh, closes and brings the chest cavity closer together, then you have um, a constriction in the chest cavity, increasing the air pressure inside your lungs, and then the air leaves. If you have hiccups, it's because you have a muscle spasm on your diaphragm, and that causes the hiccup kind of a response. Your rib cage also has intercostal muscles that helps lift the ribs up and down to increase thoracic cavity. And this is important when you're doing like excessive exercise. You'll feel the intercostal muscles maybe a little sore if you haven't been running a lot lately. Your breathing and how much you breathe is related to how much carbon dioxide is in your blood. It's actually being monitored um, by your brain and spinal cord, uh, particularly um, the um, portion right here. So you can see it's at the bottom of your brain. So breathing is controlled by the autonomic nervous system. So it's not under your direct control for the most part. The brain stem is what's generating the controls of the breathing rhythm. So groups of neurons within the medulla increase their firing rate just prior to inhalation. So the medulla is very important for maintaining the normal breathing rate. With increased firing, the diaphragm contracts and inhalation occurs. When the firing stops, the diaphragm relaxes and exhalation occurs. Exhalation is actually a passive um, so your lungs are basically just passive. They're elastic recoils that move back and forth. When breathing is high, again, your intercostal muscles will contract and fire in addition to your diaphragm, increasing um, the chest cavity and helping bring air into your lungs. CO2 or carbon dioxide actually is the being monitored. So high levels of carbon dioxide in your blood actually increases your breathing rate more than low levels of oxygen. Um, coughing and all sorts of emotional states include, influence your breathing rate. 
So here's a chart showing you carbon dioxide levels and breathing rate. So you can see that high levels of carbon dioxide increase breathing rate over um, low levels of oxygen. So carbon dioxide is really the trigger for causing the breathing rate to incur through the brainstem. And, and there's little um, nerves attached to your aorta. Remember the aorta is a major vessel on top of your heart that sends blood out through the systemic system from your left ventricles. So here's um, the cardiac body and the aorta with nerves leading strictly to the medulla. Um, they call them carotid and aortic bodies. And so they can sense um, oxygen and, and I guess carbon dioxide levels. So carbon dioxide levels are located on the medulla surface near the neurons that generate their breathing. Oxygen sensors are in tissue nodes on the aorta and, and carotid arteries called carotid and aortic bodies. If the levels of oxygen in the blood drops or if blood pressure drops, chemoreceptors in the body send nerves impulses to the brain to cause you to breathe faster. And so um, again, carbon dioxide will be the main trigger, but obviously oxygen does have an influence. Low levels of oxygen would have an influence as well. Hemoglobin is a protein consisting of four polypeptide units called heme groups. Each heme group can reversibly bind to a molecule of oxygen. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this when we get to red blood cells. But as oxygen diffuses into the blood, it increases, it binds to hemoglobin, increasing um, their affinity. Unfortunately, carbon monoxide can also bind to hemoglobin, which with a much higher affinity than oxygen and actually kill you. Now remember I said carbon monoxide, not dioxide. You breathe out carbon dioxide. Carbon monoxide is made by cars and things like that. So that's one of the problems with using combustible engines in a tight airspace, that carbon monoxide can attach to your hemoglobin and actually kill you. Let's look at a video real quick of how the lungs work. Lung cancer is the leading cause of cancer deaths in Malaysia for both men and women. Your lungs are two spongy organs in your chest. The left lung is divided into two lobes, or sections, and the right lung has three lobes. When you breathe in, air enters your nose or mouth and passes into your trachea or windpipe. At the carina, the trachea divides into two bronchi, so you can see how this has been broken up into two bronchi. You can, so here's your trachea and the bronchi, and then it'll go into bronchioles, and then ultimately it'll lead to these alveoli. Again, this is just um, an elastic. There's no muscles on this inflating the lungs. It's due to the diaphragm. Then branches into smaller bronchioles. The bronchioles end in tiny air sacs or alveoli. You see how they're Here, inflating. the oxygen in the air you inhale passes into the bloodstream, and carbon dioxide from your body passes out of the bloodstream. The carbon dioxide is expelled from your body when you exhale. Your lungs are encased by pleura, a thin membrane that protects them and helps them slide back and forth as you breathe in and out. So you have that pleura, there. remember there's a surfactant that I just described a little bit, that's a little bit mucousy that helps the lungs not to stick. Underneath your lungs is the diaphragm, a smooth, thin muscle that helps your lungs expand and contract as you breathe. Your lungs are connected to small collections of immune system cells called lymph nodes by way of lymphatic vessels. You have groups of these lymph nodes near your lungs, above your collarbones, and behind your breastbone, 
as well as in other parts of your body. The lymphatic vessels carry bacteria, cancer cells, and other unhealthy material away from your lungs and other organs in a clear fluid called lymph. Lymph nodes filter this material out of the lymph. Lung cancers most commonly start in the bronchi, but they can also begin in the trachea, bronchioles, or alveoli. Let's look at countercurrent exchange if I have that. After this one, will this will be we'll finish. This will be the end of this. Fish lecture, are aquatic animals. Water contains water. oxygen dissolved in it. Depending on temperature and other factors, the level of dissolved oxygen in water is about four to fifteen milligrams per liter. Fish extract this dissolved oxygen from the surrounding water by a process called aquatic respiration. Fish have specialized structures called gills to carry out exchange of gases with water. The gills are located on either side of the head of fish. And you'll see right in front of it is the gill rakers I was telling you about to provide protection to the gills. And then the lamella will be going across it. Behind the mouth cavity. In bony fish, the gills are covered by a hard bony flap called the operculum. It is also known as gill cover. In cartilaginous fish, the operculum is lacking and the individual openings to gills are called gill slits. During the process of exchange of gases, a fish first gulps water through its mouth. At the time of the intake of water, the mouth opens while the operculum remains closed. The fish then closes its mouth and opens the operculum That's to force the water the out through the gills. The color of the gills is dark red or brown red because of the presence of a large number of blood capillaries in it. These capillaries come in close contact with the current of water crossing the gills. And then you see the lamella on top. Blood absorbs the dissolved oxygen from the water by diffusion. The unique structure of the gills ensures that they absorb most of the oxygen dissolved in the water that is passing between them. Simultaneously, carbon dioxide from the blood diffuses out of the gill capillaries into the water. The water containing carbon dioxide is expelled through the open operculum. Besides being the respiratory organs, the gills also play an important role in maintaining the balance of salts in fish. Fishes like bluegill, seahorse, lion. Anyway, thank you for your attention and that and we'll continue talking more about cells and the rest of respiration and back to circulation and finish up these two sections in the next lecture or two. Uh, take care.